Hey everybody, as you're joining, welcome to Lunchtime Bites with Earthshore North Carolina, our fifth week. Very excited that you're here. Um, the recipe for this week was fried apples, but I didn't get around to frying them, so I brought an apple just so you would have that in your mind. If you want that recipe, just go back to this, the website where you registered and uh, fry up some seasonal apples. Um, let me share this here. And we will get started in just a couple of minutes. Um, we'll wait for some folks to join. Looks like my uh, screen share is yelling. I heard that at least one person went on and snagged a recipe without actually attending the the lunchtime bites. Ooh, now that <laughs> is sneaky. That is sneaky. <laughs> Someone we all know. No. Don't want to share your source. Oh, someone we all know. I'm sorry that I, I just heard that. I don't think so. Okay. And nobody I'm going to tell on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're good recipes. They're also fun because they're they're drawn out. They have a nice uh, aesthetic. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, just another minute or so as folks are joining. Again, thank you for coming to Lunchtime Bites week five. We have uh, North Carolina Coastal Federation here as well as Triangle Land Conservancy and we're very excited to hear from them. All right, Heather, do you want to kick us off with an introduction? Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I am so pleased to have you all here. If you're in the Triangle, you're enjoying a rainy day. Not sure what it's like in other parts of the state, um, but it's a good time to have a cup of tea and, and uh, take a moment to meet with some of our nonprofits. Um, just um, I just want to share a little bit about who we are because this invitation to Lunchtime Bites has gone far and wide and we have a lot of people who are new to Earthshare North Carolina uh, participating today. So we are a coalition of nonprofit organizations that are working for the health of our natural resources and the very foundation uh, that are the foundation of North Carolina's health and quality of life. And so this includes uh, rivers that sustain our fisheries, air quality that is safe for all North Carolinians, land use that supports healthy and sustainable food, access to wildlands that feed our soul and our physical and mental health, which is uh, extraordinarily important right now. Um, and these organizations are working every day on these and, and everything that you can think of uh, related to protecting the health of our environment and natural resources. Uh, we are 28 North Carolina-based um, organizations, and we also are part of a national network um, of organizations that work on issues that transcend state borders. And two of the things that are absolutely critical to the effectiveness of all these groups um, is that they have people dedicated to their missions and they have resources to fuel their programs. And Earthshare North Carolina's unique purpose is to help achieve those two requirements. Uh, we do that by connecting more people and resources with the work of these organizations through um, corporate engagement programs, partnering with companies like yours um, to make these connections in meaningful ways like today. Um, so on the next slide, you might notice some Earthshare nonprofit organizations that you've volunteered with already or donated to or you know, simply know about. Um, and I imagine that there are, are others that would be new to you. And um, I'm so pleased that you joined so that I can introduce you to the work of 
two of these organizations today, um, Kelly Bodie from North Carolina Coastal Federation um, is going to talk with us first and then followed by Elena Peterman from Triangle Land Conservancy. Um, and before we jump into this, I want you to point your attention to the chat box where Rachel is going to put our um, link to the Earthshare North Carolina's Impact Magazine, um, virtual magazine. And I would just encourage you to go there um, after this. The first slide is um, a less than two minute video about our Share North Carolina um, members. So it'll give you a way to see, um, to build on what we're talking about today in a very condensed way. Um, so I will, Kelly, pass it off to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope we're all enjoying um, a soggy day, soggy day here in the Triangle. Um, it is just a little bit crazy that we're talking about another hurricane. Um, uh, and, and the season is not over yet, so this is a perfect time to talk about coastal resilience. Um, I am the membership director at the North Carolina Coastal Federation, and I'm actually based in Chapel Hill. Um, the North Carolina Coastal Federation has been working to protect and restore the coast for over 35 years. And here's a snapshot um, of what we do. We have over 30 staff and 30 board members. We have three coastal offices. I say that, but of course, everyone is working from home during the pandemic. Um, and our mission is to cover the 20 coastal counties of North Carolina um, to protect and restore the coast. And we key on uh, five goals, clean water, living shorelines, oysters, reducing marine debris, and effective coastal management. And today my presentation is going to touch on um, living shorelines and oysters, though our goals are really inter disciplinary and when we talk about resilience it um, it covers a lot of these areas this is just a snapshot of some of our great volunteers out out in the field we miss our volunteers so much during the pandemic erosion shoreline erosion um, maybe you've seen examples of this um, these are both snapshots from the sound side um, along our estuaries. And for the sake of this presentation and for our mission, we really focus on the estuary side um, less so than the ocean side. Um, but the natural hydrology of the coast is vitally important to protecting us from storms, um, from just motorboat traffic, uh, from development, um, to reduce flooding, and to improve habitat. So you might have seen an approach like a bulkhead, um, a hardened shoreline like, like this. This is pretty common to see um, concrete, wood, rock. The issue with a hardened shoreline is that when waves hit this solid surface, they reverberate. The energy doesn't have anywhere to be absorbed. And so that wave energy actually goes out and captures sand from elsewhere and it can make erosion problems worse. Um, compare that to a living shoreline that distributes the energy into rock, shell, grass, soil, sand, and make sure that the energy kind of stops there, as well as sand is a crude. Sand ends up living on the land side of, of that little um, rock or oyster sill. And this is just, um, you know, if we were to slice that in half uh, to look at the side view, um, that the waves, kind of hit that subtle uh, ramp of rock or shell. Um, and behind that, we plant marsh grasses. Um, we plant them one by one 
with the help of loads of volunteers. And then as the um, wave energy decreases over time, the um, marsh plants will actually spread themselves. Um, and this really mimics well the natural hydrology of the sound side of our coast. So when we talk about resilience being tested, um, we don't have to imagine that. Uh, I know that North Carolina has fared pretty well, all things considered in, in this hurricane season, knock on wood, but we weren't always that lucky. So um, here's some science from 2011 and 2016. The pictures, you can see the, um, the column on the left is before and the column on the right is after. These are neighbors. They live about 1,500 feet apart. And um, the living shoreline fared much better in 2011. The uh, poor homeowner in, um, in the bulkhead picture practically lost their entire backyard. And we saw s similar results from Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Florence as well. So resilience is really an approach to keeping that property safe, keeping human life safe, keeping um, all of our communities and habitat safe, and it comes with some bonus features. Um, before I get to that, I just want to show some pictures of our work in, in action. Um, and you'll notice that you, um, the rock is, is actually shell um, sitting, sitting in bags. And you might recall that picture of volunteers holding the bags of shell. Here's another example where, where you can see that. And notice the marsh grasses planted behind it. And here's just a cascade of what happens over time. Um, this is from Jones Island uh, in uh, just outside of Swansboro, um, where it was totally barren, planted grasses, and then after six years, it's so full of, of grass. And that creates vital habitat. Here, um, another before and after as our volunteers are placing those oyster bags. So the key, the magic sauce is um, two birds with one stone, and this is where our goal has become interdisciplinary, is using recycled shell um, to work with nature to provide habitat at the same time. Baby oysters called spat are fortunately naturally occurring in North Carolina waters. And their favorite place to call home is on a, an existing oyster shell. So if you recycle shells into North Carolina waters, they will eventually become encrusted in new baby oysters growing vertically um, and filtering up to 50 gallons of water per day. So the three F's of oysters that are so important, food, filtration, and fish habitat. They really create this calm, still area for baby fish and shrimp to, um, to grow before seeking out deeper waters. We obtain the recycled shells um, from a number of different sources um, and for everyone listening, I encourage you to visit ncoast.org to seek out sites where you can recycle your own shells because it's like gold to us. We want to use them in living shoreline projects to produce more oysters. Picture of oysters growing. This is at Trinity, uh, Trinity Shoreline on the sound side of Emerald Isle. Maybe you guys are familiar with it. Um, and just look at the growth of oysters over time and the growth of marsh grasses. This is a resilient and um, beautiful coastline that we can all enjoy. You can learn more at ncoast.org and remember to recycle your oyster shells. Thank you so much, Kelly. 
never learned so much about oysters in one like eight minute <laughs> event. Um, so we're gonna switch it over to Elena and I'm gonna make you the presenter so you can start with that. Um, while you're doing that, uh, Elena Peterman is the Community Engagement Associate uh, one of the, at Triangle Land Conservancy, one of their AmeriCorps members this year. And uh, she's gonna speak on Triangle Land Conservancy's preserves and specifically their work with restorative agriculture. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, my name is Elena Peterman. Um, as uh, Kelly mentioned, I'm the Community Engagement Associate out at TLC. Um, my work mainly focuses on the Bailey and Sarah Williamson Preserve in Eastern Wake County. Um, and I just want to give y'all a quick um, sort of overview of TLC's work if you're not familiar. Um, so TLC was founded in 1983 by a group of dedicated citizens um, who are really committed to balancing this region's growth with um, sort of conserving wild space in the Triangle region. Um, and so since that time, we've protected over 141 miles of stream and over 20,000 acres of land across Wake, Orange, Durham, Chatham, Lee, and Johnson counties. Um, and so TLC um, just strives to create a healthier and more vibrant triangle region by safeguarding clean water, protecting natural habitats, supporting local farms and food, and connecting people with nature. Um, and this sort of happens through land protection and stewardship, um, catalyzing community action and collaboration. And TLC's approach to conservation is not one of protecting land from people, but connecting or protecting land for people. Um, and so the benefits of land con conservation include safeguarding clean water, protecting natural habitats, um, uh, connecting folks with nature, and supporting local farms and food. Um, and today I'm going to be focusing speci specifically on the, the farms and food aspect of um, this sort of conservation uh, approach. And specifically out at the, ba the Bailey and Sarah Williamson Preserve. So um, this property was purchased by TLC in 2013. Um, it was um, acquired through partial donation by Bailey and Sarah's daughters and grants from state and local governments. Um, so here you see an aerial view of just one section of the farm. These are some historic farm buildings and some silos. Um, the property is situated in the Walnut Hill Historic District. Um, in total, it's uh, 405 acres in the Marks Creek watershed in Eastern Wake County. So it has really important um, value for the watershed. Um, and it's sort of this amazing patchwork of, of forest and farmland connecting to the Noose River Greenway and the Mountains to Seed Trail. Um, and so I want to sort of briefly um, touch on the sort of vision and planning behind this preserve, just as a sort of integrated mixed use conservation space. Um, so TLC took a three pronged approach focusing on agriculture, history and natural resources. Um, and so the Williamson Preserve really dynamically blends um, a bunch of different goals. So from re recreation to nature education to agricultural production and training. Um, and, and also, you know, we, we really focus on the historic legacy of this region and of this property. Um, and we've been lucky enough to, to partner with the Community Histories Project out of UNC Chapel Hill. Um, doing an archival deep dive on this farm and, and sort of agricultural history more broadly. Um, and we just think it's really important, sort of especially in the South, to acknowledge that this land is really connected to histories of indigenous land theft and um, enslavement. So, so that really foregrounds our work out at Williamson. Um, and, and we really take this history with us when we um, plan how to work on the property and sort of think about land use moving forward. And so I'll, I'll next share this kind of overwhelming map. Um, so, so this is the sort of aspirational plan for, for just a section of the preserve. Um, and so as you, I, I sort of want to share this just as a visualization of, of the dynamic nature of this property. Um, and so we're working on mixing both um, recreation space. So you can see some walking trails along here, um, these historic buildings situated in this green area over here. Um, and, and sort of the collaborative nature of this property. So we, we partnered with Wake County Soil and Water to um, start a pollinator garden. And then some of these other colored sections are either currently being farmed by partners or will be farmed in the future. So we're just sort of at the inception of this project. Um, and I just wanted to give you sort of an overview. Um, 
but before I go further, I, I want to sort of um, answer the question, what does farming have to do with conservation? Um, and I think for a lot of folks, these topics don't really seem intuitively connected. I think a lot of people sort of think of conservation as setting aside tracts of wild land, sort of not to be touched. Um, but out at Williamson, we are really invested in regenerative agriculture, um, which is a practice of farming and, and sort of inhabiting land that works on restoring um, soils and ecologies. And, and we see this as really um, sort of uh, generative in the context of conservation. Um, and so I'll give you guys a quick definition of regenerative agriculture um, for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, so we define it as a collection of farming practices, um, many of which are rooted in traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous practice. So I just want to foreground that these are not new ideas. Um, and these practices work to build healthy soils, protect waterways, increase biodiversity, improve animal and crop health, and improve overall farm and soil resilience. Um, and so there are a bunch of different practices that fall under this broader category, including market gardening, agroforestry, silvopasture, regenerative grazing, carbon farming. Um, any one of those topics we could go into for hours, but um, I'll just instead switch to talking about um, one of our practitioners who I think really exemplifies this ethic. Um, this is Jake Newbold. Um, this is him with his adorable calf from last winter. Um, so Jake and Catherine Newbold of Newbold Farms are just one of our farm partners out at Williamson. Um, and they bring years of expertise raising cattle using regenerative practices. Um, and so they use things like rotational grazing, cover cropping um, to sort of both raise healthy animals, um, provide good food for the community, and improve soil and ecological health. Um, and, you know, one of the essential benefits of, of this kind of grazing and animal husbandry is, is actually carbon drawdown, which is a really exciting sort of benefit of regenerative agriculture is that it's actually a piece of mitigating climate change. So um, this kind of agriculture works to sequester atmospheric CO2 into the soil. Um, and so as Jake says, so some of the big tenets of regenerative farming are limiting tillage, protecting soil, protecting biodiversity and animal grazing. And so we really see this as a holistic and, and sort of multi beneficial approach to farming. Um, yeah, and so I'll, I'll just move on to um, sort of switch away from our agricultural side and, and talk a little bit about the ways that folks can come out and enjoy the property. So in addition to sort of having these exciting farming projects underway, um, the Williamson Preserve just recently opened in September to the public. It's our newest preserve um, and it has miles of trails for hiking and mountain biking. Um, as I said before, it connects to the Noose River Greenway and the Mount Sissipi Trail. Um, yeah, and the parking lot has just been full with tons of people taking advantage of it in the last couple of weeks. And, um, you know, I think as Heather mentioned at the beginning, especially um, given the current pandemic, like I think that the value of these spaces to get out, to um, enjoy sort of exercise and time outside and to connect with folks outdoors um, is sort of more and more essential. And I think especially with um, the growth and development of the Triangle region, um, properties like the Williamson Preserve just become all the more essential. Um, yeah, and just before I finish up, I, I wanna give a special thanks to our donors and volunteers out of the Williamson Preserve. It's definitely a community effort and we're so lucky to have the support of the folks like Earthshare and Sea, um, as well as just the amazing constellation of folks involved out of the Williamson Preserve. Um, yeah, and so thank you so much. Thank you, Elena. Um, I really appreciate you sharing that. And I am personally excited to go visit the Williamson Preserve. Um, so we have probably a couple minutes here. If anybody has questions for each, either of our panelists, I also will set up this raffle that I know everyone's waiting for. Um, <laughs> so that we can share the amazing gifts that each of our um, presenters here, as well as uh, all throughout the program, have shared with us lots of t-shirts, water bottles. Um, North Carolina Coastal Federation shared an oyster knife so that you can start working on collecting shells to improve our shorelines. Very, very <laughs> appreciative of that. Um, and TLC shared a cool bag with a t-shirt, a water bottle, a koozie, 
um, just the whole shebang. So, um, so if I see any questions come through, I will ask them and let me get this randomizer set up. Okay. All right, let's do a little drum roll. <laughs> um, the winner is Janet Kenworthy. Janet, are you you're still here, right? See it in there. Okay. Um, so Janet, if you want to send me your email address in the chat, or I can find you in the registration page, I will have that sent out to you um, shortly. I also put everyone's or all the speakers' email address, their name, and uh, the website for their organization in the chat. So you all should be able to grab that if you need it. Um, and we're just grateful to everyone who attended any of our events um, this this fall. We're, we're so excited with the, the turnout. Um, and hopefully we will see you again in the future. Um, Heather, did you want to wrap up with anything? I sure will. Um, as Rachel said, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, and we are closing a couple minutes early. So Rachel, I'm going to ask you to put the link into the chat box again uh, for the inspiring video um, and magazine that we have this year um, that really uh, gives you a, a more, uh, the video gives you a less than two minute uh, introduction to a broad cross section of our members work. And then the magazine um, goes into more depth. Um, but in both things, what I hope you'll see is a reason to invest in this work. Um, you can do that. Many of you have workplace giving programs where Ursher North Carolina is included, or if not, can be written in uh, to your giving platform, or you can make a gift directly through the Donate Now button. Um, on our website. So uh, thank you so much for investing your time in uh, hearing about these groups work today. And um, I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. We'll see you soon.